you have taken an active role in bettering your life, no matter what stage of life you are in. The Banyan Treatment Center's podcast will discuss many topics like recovery, addiction, self-help, mental health, and so much more. It will provide you with tools to succeed, ideas for recovering, and how-tos on creating a better life. My name is Alyssa. In today's episode, we are diving into a topic that is filled with promise, transformation, and renewal, the benefits of sobriety and life after addiction. Today, we have Tom Conrad joining us, recovery advocate and podcast host of Real Recovery Talk. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. How are you? I'm very good. How are you? Good. Thank you. So tell us about your podcast, Real Recovery Talk. When did it start? What is it about? Yeah, so the podcast itself was, it originally was just an idea. First off, I had this idea. I I knew I wanted to start one, but as a lot of people do when they get into the whole podcasting, they get, they talk themselves out of it. Mm -hmm. So I had an idea and I sat on that idea for probably about a year, year and a half because it was like information overload, all the technical things I couldn't, I didn't really want to try and figure it all out. And one day I just got angry at myself primarily. And I just grabbed a uh, cheap microphone that I had. I plugged it into my computer and I just started talking into it. And I didn't know, you know, where it was going to go or anything like that. But the primary purpose, I suppose, of starting the podcast was more for families and loved ones, Mm -hmm. because a lot of times, as we know, um, a lot of the attention is given towards the addict and the alcoholic, you know, and Hey, you're going to treatment. Hey, you're doing these things. That's great. You know, we're going to cheer you on and support you and, and be there for you. And the families and loved ones kind of got left behind to just figure it out. Yeah. And so it was, for me, it was a, I just knew it was kind of a pain point for a lot of people. So I wanted to start the podcast primarily just to kind of give parents and loved ones uh, uh, answers to questions that they would have and, um, you know, just kind of let them know. And I I often in the early stages, I called it the ever changing landscape of addiction, you know, how how things change, uh, what to expect from addiction and alcoholism, how you can help by helping yourself, so on and so forth. And since it's evolved, I mean. It started October of 2017, so it's been a while. It's and a long time. <laughs> 300 and, yeah, 320 some episodes in, and it's good. I mean, it's 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 great. It's I enjoy it, you know, and a lot of interaction from families and loved ones. It's on YouTube as well, um, and then obviously Spotify, Apple Podcast, all that stuff, and they send us emails, questions, and stuff like that. So it's pretty cool. That's awesome. Well, we're happy as a fellow podcast to support it as well. So let's talk about you. Let's start at the beginning. Um, You know, you're in recovery. Mm -hmm. Let's talk the addiction story. Where did it begin? Yeah. So I grew up in Pennsylvania, um, just outside of Pittsburgh. And it was just, um, you know, kind of typical. My upbringing wasn't terrible. It was just a, it was an average upbringing. It was just me and my dad. My mom had left when I was two, yada, yada, yada. Um, And so I quickly found out that it was, there were going to be, there were a lot of freedoms given to me at an early age, just because of the situation I had, you know, my dad had to go to work. He had to provide for me and, you know, put food on the table, so on and so forth. So as soon as I was old enough to be trusted that I wouldn't kill myself or somebody else or burn the house down, it was like kind of, you know, do your thing. And that started off with just, you know, social drinking and stuff like that at a very young age, probably about 12, 12, 13 years old, and then slowly progressed. And once I got my driver's license at 16, that kind of it, that was a pretty pivotal moment for me because now I can drive places, I can drive to all my friends' houses, so on and so forth. And, you know, it was uh, weekends, you know, we're, we drank, you know, mm-hmm. we drank, we, I lived in like backwoods, Pennsylvania. So we all had four wheelers and stuff. So we'd strap a case of beer on the back of our four wheelers and just, you know, go have fun. And um, 
it progressed, you know, it progressed from there to drinking during the week. I barely graduated high school. I managed, they just kind of pushed me through, um, all the while developing what I know now as alcoholism and, uh, fast forward to 26. Um, I was drinking daily, you know, a, a case of beer a day, easy, Um, I was an auto mechanic, so I went to, I graduated high school, went to technical school to work on cars. And I did that for, you know, a long time. Well, I mean, relatively a long time, Yeah. you know, that's what we did. It was a very blue collar place. You know, we all went to work and we got done with work and would, you know, go somewhere, drink beers, you know, do all the things, work on trucks and go mud bogging and do all this stuff. And at 26, all of my hobbies and everything that I had enjoyed doing growing up, uh, I all that was kind of pushed by the wayside. And I was drinking, like I said, every single day. My friends changed. You know, I was constantly looking for people that could drink as much as me. Um, but then I started looking for people that drank more than me. Oh, dear. <laughs> because I wanted to be able to look at them and say, when I get that bad, then I'll make a change. Mm-hmm obviously have all the war stories that go with it, but you know, we kind of at this point all know what they are, you know, loss of relationships, so on and so forth. The health consequences, I wasn't eating. I was having shakes. Um, I was cross addicted to benzodiazepines, you know, I was taking Xanax every day because I couldn't drink, uh, while at work, you know? So yeah, the last three weeks before I got sober, I got a DUI. Well, I I totaled my car. I worked at a car dealership that my dad worked at, and my dad was there 30 years. So I was kind of like the golden, I had the golden ticket, Mm -hmm. I guess. They wouldn't get rid of me um, because my dad made them so much money um, as as an auto technician himself. The dealership gave me a rental car, and one week later, I got a DUI in the rental car. And then one week later from there, they they had to fire me because I was a I was a huge liability. Um, so my dad actually called me on the phone cause I called out of work. I was at the bar. It was a Friday, probably two o'clock in the afternoon. And he said, you don't have a place to work anymore and you don't have a place to live anymore. And I'm like, Oh no. And so I went to the house and fortunately by God's grace, he had made some phone calls and got me into treatment. And I flew to treatment that same day. That was September 15th, 2010. I flew into Jacksonville, went to treatment in Jacksonville, and here we are today. So you've been sober since that instance? Yeah. September 15th, I flew down. I consider my sobriety date September 16th. I was an alcoholic, so they didn't put me on Suboxone or anything Mm -hmm. like that. So September 16th was, yeah. So I just celebrated 13 years. Amazing. Yeah. I just love it when you can hear that story, you know, that you didn't have to go to treatment 20 times. It is possible. It's not everybody's story, Mm -hmm. but it's possible. You do enough damage in your addiction. You know, it's very possible to to get get it right and go to treatment and take the suggestions and not have to make the same mistakes again. Yeah. And I think that a lot of times people will hear the one the white chip wonders, Mm -hmm. you know, and think to themselves, oh, they really, they probably weren't like the real deal alcoholic or the real deal drug addict or whatever. And honestly, it doesn't really matter because it's not, we're, we're not on like, we're not comparing ourselves to other people. I was fortunate in the sense of I knew that I was drinking myself to death. I knew that I was okay with that as well. Um, and, I legit didn't have anything else. You know, I, I, one thing I've noticed with people and, you know, I work in the, I've worked in the treatment field now for a long time. What I've noticed is that people that are repeat offenders, I suppose, Mm -hmm. or, you know, they, they're in and out, in and out of treatment. A lot of times they have, they have a lot of resources, you know, and they could have enabling parents. Mm-hmm. They could have, um, you know, insurance that just won't end. You know, they could have trust funds. They could have money, access to money. Um, so it really enables the behavior for years on end. And I didn't have that. I had, I had insurance 
thank God through my employer, but I didn't have the money to pay, you know, uh, the Cobra payment. And my dad was willing to do that for me, but it was very clear that if you screw this up, you're going to be homeless. And I'm not, I would not do well being homeless. Like I was spoiled rotten growing (laughs) up, you know, so you, you put me in a position to be homeless. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to do my best to not, not be homeless. So, but yeah, I mean the way the, the one time in treatment thing is I, I see it a lot. You know, it's, I see a lot of times people this, it's their first time in treatment and they, and they get it. But unfortunately, yeah, we have the people that just, you know, 10, 15, 20 times we've seen more, Yeah, you know, and it's sad. It's terrifying. Yeah. But you know, at the end of the day, sobriety is not just about picking up a drink or a drug. It's a mindset. Yeah. You know, and if you're ready to be in that mindset, if you're ready to make a change in your life, that's that first step. And it's possible with the right support and continuing to do better, even if it's just a little bit better every day, you know, continued care. I mean, it's a statistic that we see that if people stay in treatment for extended periods of time, they have a better chance of recovering and doing well when they get out. Yeah. Yeah. So I watched your story on YouTube and you mentioned the term, the fruits of sobriety. So I just wanted you to kind of go into that a little bit. Obviously your story is inspiring, you know, wanting to get sober. And we all know that being newly sober can come with tons of temptations in early recovery. So what are some of the positive changes you noticed initially? So in terms of fruits of sobriety, it's changed, um, you know, in the beginning. And I'm very vocal about this with our current clients, um, or anybody that I interact with that are that are uh, newly sober. In the beginning, for me, it was materialistic stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, materialistic uh, things are good, and I, I encourage people to get them. Um, which is kind of cliche because as the the longer that people are sober, you 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 start to understand that materialistic things don't hold as much value because it's more of a emotional, mental, spiritual, um, fruits of sobriety. But in the beginning, like it's a, it's, it's really hard to tell somebody, Hey, you're going to get sober and you're just going to be, you're going to have so many mental and emotional and spiritual fruits of sobriety that it's going to want to keep you. It, it just doesn't work that way. At least for me, it didn't. Um, I had lost everything and including, you know, vehicles. Like I said, I was spoiled rotten. So I always drove brand new cars. I worked at a car dealership. You know, I always had the newest cars, stuff like that. Nice clothes, so on and so forth. But I lost it all because I wasn't, you know, realistically, my dad was supporting me the whole time. And um, so when I got sober, these things started coming back into my life. And I remember, again, coming from having brand new vehicles to the first six months I was here in Florida, I didn't have anything out of bicycle and it got stolen as they happen all the time down here. But I ended up getting a scooter at six months, you know, the 150 CC, everybody had them, you know, and from there, probably I had that for probably another six months. And then I ended up getting a 1999 Dodge neon, and the, it, this thing was a, a piece of crap. <laughs> it was barely running, but it was a car, you know, and coming from driving new cars to that. But there was so much value in that vehicle because it was something that I earned. I bought, I paid for, even though it blew smoke out the tailpipe, it was mine. And so I encourage people to the, the, the materialistic things are important. Because it's it, that'll keep us sober in the beginning, you know. You get you ain't you gain these things, the uh, you know, the nice clothes, the cars, you know, the you know, you can go out to dinners and do these things, socialize and have fun. But at some point, that has to switch, you know, and it's it becomes less about the materialistic things and now more about the mental, emotional, spiritual fruits of sobriety. And that's something that really started taking place for me probably year two and three. Um, I got heavily involved, uh, you know, with my church and uh, met a, a whole different group of people um, and was very involved with it. It's, uh, it's where I met my wife, you know, and I was three and a half 
years sober when I met my wife. And, you know, so that obviously healthy relationships is a huge fruit of sobriety, you know, and everything that came with that. And now I have three kids and a home and cars and, you know, the materialistic things are still very important. You know, I love having nice stuff, but I have healthy relationships now. I have, you know, my family, you know, a super strong relationship with my dad who actually lives with me now because he had a stroke a year and a half ago. Um, So the tide completely turned. I was dependent on him for the longest time and now he's completely dependent on me, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, So the fruits of sobriety for me is something that, you know, they keep coming, you know, they keep growing and uh, I attribute it all to, you know, my sobriety, my faith, you know, and just where I'm at today overall, Mm -hmm. if that answers your question. It answers quite a few questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you you brought up your church and how you built that community. You met your wife. I mean, that's such a, a beautiful place to flourish with a community. What are some other recovery communities that you can recommend people get involved in? Well, you know, it's, of course, for me, Alcoholics Anonymous is the, there's a reason it's been around for as long as it has been. Yeah. I mean, we you can't. You can't really debate that. It's gotten millions of people sober at this point. So I think that that's a very, very good starting point for people. Um, Outside of that, I tell people this. I don't care what you do as long as you do something. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of programs out there. There's Smart Recovery. There's Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, you know, all kind of 12-step programs, which I think is the best way to go. Um you know, celebrate recovery is, is a, is a good thing. Believers in recovery. There's a ton. Um, one thing that I will say is COVID really kind of changed things for a lot of people. And I actually talked about this, Ben and I recently on one of our episodes, and it really kind of lowered the bar for people to get involved in sobriety, both in a good way and a bad way. You know, when COVID started, all the meetings shut down. Yeah. You know, so everybody's now forced to attend their meetings from behind a camera. And there were there wasn't a human connection there. It was good. It made it very convenient for people because now you don't have to get in your car and drive somewhere and, you know, socialize and everything else. But that's why it became a bad thing. Because fast forward to today, still a lot of people rely on Zoom or these, um, you know, webinar style meetings to where I think that you really sell yourself short, uh, the opportunities inside of a 12 step program. If you don't attend meetings in person, the convenience factor of it almost went too far and it, it's gotten hard for people to, cause you have to get up out of your chair You have to get in your car. You have to drive to the meeting. You're relatively forced to socialize with people. If you're not somebody that likes to socialize, you have to do that. Because if you go to a meeting, chances are if you're sitting there and you're just kind of, you know, not talking to anybody, people are going to come up to you whether you like it or not. Um, So I think that's one of the best things that people can do is attend meetings in person. Um, I tell people use the Zoom stuff as more of like a supplement. Mm-hmm. Just like if we're if we're deficient in vitamin D, vitamin B, whatever, we're going to try and get those from foods first and then supplement it with a vitamin. Same thing with our program, you know, get get the base from interaction with people, so on and so forth, and then supplement with the other stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're told you need to change everything, including your friends. And how can you build a recovery community if you're not actually meeting people in person? Yeah. And you don't get the same emotional benefit of being behind a computer screen than being in the room and feeling each other's feelings. Yeah. And you miss out. You miss out, too. Like there's always and we know it, the meeting after the meeting. Yes. You know, for me personally, the meetings were kind of like they were good. They were, you know, I didn't mind them, but Mm -hmm. it wasn't what I enjoyed the most. And still to this day, I enjoy before the meeting. I enjoy after the meeting. You know, we go out to dinner. We do these things. We have go to, you know, basketball seasons back. So like a lot of my buddies, we go to, 
Miami Heat games and stuff like that, you know, just interaction with people that are yeah. sober. And you don't get that from behind a computer screen. No, you do not. Yeah. Do you think that if you didn't go to treatment and get your alcoholism under control, do you think that you would have the same level of, level of success that you have today? No, not a shot. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, it's, you know, I was doing something that I felt forced to do to begin with. Yeah. You know, like I said, my dad was a mechanic and it was kind of not forced upon me, but it was the only thing that I knew, you know, so I, I it was an opportunity and I, I don't regret it at all. But no, I mean, I don't think that had I had I stayed in Pennsylvania, you know, would I have gotten sober? Maybe. I don't know. Who knows? But would I be where I'm at today? I highly doubt it. You know, because I sp spent the first 26 years of my life up there and I, well, I was just up there a couple years ago with my son. I took him there for the first time and I saw a lot of the same people doing a lot of the same things, mm -hmm. working at all the same jobs and hanging at the same bars. And so, no. I, I don't. And honestly, I feel bad. And I still connect with a couple people from up there. Two people in particular that I grew up with, I talked to on a regular basis. And they said to me, you know, that was one of the best things you could have did. You know, they said, I grew up in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. And they're like, we if we could get out of here, we would tomorrow. You know, so no, I don't think so. I don't think I don't think I'd be anywhere near where I'm at. Yeah, change is good. Yeah. Change is very good for people, even if it makes you uncomfortable. Honestly, if it makes you uncomfortable, that's the best kind of change you can possibly have. Yeah, you have to get you have to get uncomfortable. I mean, if this whole process was easy, then everybody would be doing it. Exactly. But nobody is really. What does life look like for you today? Um, I mean, great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's good. I, I had you know, when I, I got sober in 2010 and had an opportunity to open uh, Rock Recovery Center in 2014, and it, it's been something, and I didn't open it myself. Let me just clarify that. There's, there's a few of us that are involved. My life today is, you know, I get to do what I love, mm -hmm. obviously. You know, I have a podcast, been doing it for a long time. I love it. There's you know, the editing aspect of it, the just talking to people, conversing, stuff like that is is a lot of fun to me. And just overseeing the everyday operations of this treatment center mm -hmm. uh, is, for me, is, is extremely fruitful. Uh, I don't consider it work at all. You know, honestly, the work starts when I get home <laughs> because I have three kids, you know, seven, five, and three. I have a wife. I have a house. I got, you know, responsibilities there. Um, you know, so my life today is it's busy as it should be with three kids and, you know, a career and stuff like that. But I enjoy every minute of it, even if I don't seem as if I do, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for what I have, you know, but you know, my son is in gymnastics 12 hours a week. My daughter's in gymnastics six hours a week. My youngest daughter's in gymnastics two hours a week. And my wife is, uh, you know, we do homeschool and she, well, we do like a co-op type thing and she's teaching twice a week. And so we're kind of, this season, we're two ships passing in the night, but you know, it's, it's all worth it, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, you know, I, even when I get into the, you know, grumpy dad vibes, you know, it's because of my sobriety and what I have today not in materialistic stuff and the mental, emotional, spiritual fruits of my sobriety. I'm able to kind of sit back and chill out and look at everything that we've accomplished as a family, as a treatment center, you know, and uh, just be grateful for it. And, you know, I wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, I really wouldn't. I can't think of anything that I would change in the past, and I can't think of anything that I would change today in the present. So. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that level of gratitude, being able to sit back and say, my life might be full and hectic, but it is wholesomely full. Yeah. And look at the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. You know, just having children in and of itself and getting to witness them experience the world and yeah. know that you're building a strong foundation for them and you couldn't have done it without your sobriety to start. 
Yeah, and my kids get to see it too. You know, my I don't I don't hide my kids from what I do. You know, they I have them here at my studio, and you know they'll they'll come in here and yank on the microphones <laughs> and push buttons, and I'll flip out. Don't touch that! Don't touch that! But you know, and they hear the phone calls when I'm talking to parents and loved ones. You know, and I want them to hear those things, even though sometimes it's a little. You know, if it gets too graphic or whatever, which it can, you know, then I'll I'll turn the Bluetooth off yeah. and I'll, you know, I'll talk on the phone. But I don't shield them from that. I think it's something that, you know, because I was, you know, it well, it's just part of their experience, you know, and I'm grateful to be able to give that to them and obviously provide for them. And, you know, the, one thing that I try and do is I don't take anything for granted, you know, because this all could be gone tomorrow. Yeah. You know, if I pick up and I just have to remember that and I'm not susceptible to relapse. I'll tell you that, you know, just because I have 13 years sober does not mean that I'm like immune to picking up a drink or a drug because I, I definitely can. And I've thought about it. Mm -hmm. I really have, you know, and I think that people that say that they haven't, you know, are, are probably lying to you or to themselves, you know. The main thing is, is I never acted on it. What advice would you give to someone who's currently struggling? Um, you know, that's a great question. We could probably talk two hours about <laughs> that. But I guess to, you know, to sum it up in a couple of sentences, just, you know, don't feel ashamed. You know, it's it's. The first thing is, if if you're even recognizing the fact that you want to get help, you're you're vastly ahead of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Um. A lot of people are in complete denial and chances are you you've been in denial and now you're getting to that point to where you can't really deny it anymore. So don't feel bad. Don't, you know, don't feel ashamed and, you know, talk to people, you know, don't try and hold it in. Don't try and white knuckle it, you know, don't try and do it on your own because chances are you won't be able to uh, talk to your parents, talk to your loved ones, talk to your spouse, you know, I, I don't know if I would talk to your children about it, but, you know, it I guess depending on how old your kids are, you know, we see people get s sober, clean and sober at 60, 65 years old, you know, 70 years old. You know, if you have grown children, talk to them. You know, it's it's nothing to be ashamed of. And honestly, it's it, it, it's scary, but you have to start somewhere, you know, so just reach out to people, you know, talk to them and and uh, yeah, that's it. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, absolutely. It was fun. It was a pleasure meeting you. You as well. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's episode. Remember that growth and recovery are possible and it can all start today. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Banyan Treatment Centers. And make sure you're subscribing for notifications of new episodes. And please don't forget to leave us a review. If you or someone you know are struggling, call us today at 888-515-7706. Thanks for joining us today on the Banyan Podcast. Mm -hmm.